Hi and welcome. Today we're going to discuss 10 different tests that you can consider to assess nitric oxide levels in your patients. Hi, my name is Dr. Aria Messimer. I'm a functional medicine practitioner, doctor of physical therapy, registered dietitian, and I'm the owner of the Movement Paradigm Integrative Health Center in the Philadelphia area. I'm also a medical educator for Rupa Health. So let's dive in. So we know that nitric oxide is so powerful for so many physiological functions in our body, including the regulation of blood pressure, our immune response, our neural communication. It is the master vasodilator. So therefore, it can allow blood, nutrients, and oxygen to travel to every part of our body effectively. But its accurate detection and quantification are critical to understanding its influence and impact on health and disease. And because it has an extremely short physiological half-life, it can be challenging to test this amazing molecule. So as I mentioned, we know that nitric oxide is responsible for vasodilation and regulating blood flow at its peak performance. But deficiency in nitric oxide can contribute to a lot of symptoms associated with decreased blood circulation. So some of those things can be things like narrowed blood vessels, inflamed artery walls, permeable vascular walls, elevated blood sugar, muscular soreness and poor recovery from exercise. It can be impaired erections in men, but it also can be decreased around in women. Nitric oxide acts as a neurotransmitter in the brain to release oxytocin, which is the central modulator in sexual behavior. It can also decrease wound healing, among many other things. So when we're looking at it from an overall perspective, we want to think of its influence on blood pressure, platelet aggregation, cerebral blood flow, vascular function, physical exercise, mitochondrial function, bone marrow, and peripheral artery disease. So let's do a quick review of the pathways. So the first pathway is the NOS pathway. So the nitric oxide synthase pathway, which unfortunately this is the one that is greatly affected as we get older. By the age of 40, it can decrease nitric oxide production up to 50%. So that makes us really rely on the next pathway, which is the enterosalivary pathway. For the enterosalivary pathway, which is nitrate to nitrite to nitric oxide, we are consuming nitrates through the diet. And the nitrates are actually going to to be reduced to nitrates in the commensal bacteria of that posterior aspect of the tongue. Then it moves down to the acidic environment of the stomach, which is where we have our stomach acid that's going to further reduce the nitrate to nitric oxide. Then the nitrates are going to be absorbed into the bloodstream via the small intestine and and the digestive tract. The nitrates in the bloodstream are going to be further reduced to more nitric oxide, and especially if there are hypoxic conditions. And then ultimately nitrates and nitrites are reabsorbed in the kidneys, and this completes this enterosalivary circulation of nitrates. So how do we get L-arginine? So this is an amino acid that we can get several ways from endogenous synthesis. So the human body can naturally produce L-arginine through the urea cycle. And then of course, from dietary sources such as our animal proteins, red meat, poultry, fish, eggs, dairy products, and some plant sources as well, such as nuts, seeds, soybeans, and legumes. So now we'll move into the parasinus pathway. So in this case, nitric oxide is synthesized within the paranasal sinuses in the endothelial cells by enzymes called nitric oxide synthases. This accumulates within the sinus cavity, and then when you inhale through the nose, this is where nasal breathing is really critical for nitric oxide production here, the air passes through the nasal passages and picks up the nitric oxide from the sinuses. It's transported to the lungs, and then in the lungs, the nitric oxide helps regulate the function of the airway and blood vessels. So with each breath, more nitric oxide is drawn from the sinuses to maintain a cycle that supports respiratory health, provided that we are breathing nasally not through our mouth. So now we're going to move into 10 different tests that we can look at, and we're going to break these up into some direct tests and some indirect tests. Because when we're looking at nitric oxide and all of its influences on the body and the physiological processes, we want to be able to look at it through a lot of different lenses. And so if we understand the pathways and how nitric oxide is produced and optimized, then we could begin to really look at what are the things that are going to affect us? What are the things, what are the symptoms and concerns your patients might be having that you might want to look into it and look at it through the lens of nitric oxide.
So the first test that is used is called the fractioned nitric oxide test. So this would be a test where you would do in your physician's office where you're breathing into a machine and you're looking at the exhaled nitric oxide levels. This test is specifically used for diagnosing and controlling asthma because it can identify inflammation in the airways. Because when we're referring back to our pathways, we want to think about all of the impact that nitric oxide is having on our airway. But there is an element of recirculation that's happening happening when everything is optimized. However, in this particular case, if we are exhaling the nitric oxide, which I know sounds counterintuitive, if that is higher, that is actually signaling that there could be inflammation and issues with bronchodilation. The next test that we can look at to assess nitric oxide is a genetic test. So the three by four genetics test and blueprint is extremely valuable. It analyzes over 134 different genes. It organizes the information into the gene's potential effect on a particular biological pathway. So when we're collecting all of this data on genetic SNPs, it's really helpful to look at how the pathways are affected and how we can make lifestyle, behavioral, and nutritional changes. So as it relates to nitric oxide, we can look specifically at nitric oxide SNPs, but then we can also look at many other SNPs that might be influenced by or influence nitric oxide. So we could look at something like BH4, which decreased BH4 cofactor availability would be involved in NOS dysfunction function leading to reactive oxygen species and reduced levels of nitric oxide. So this can be really valuable in understanding a on a deeper level about someone's genetic variants and how this can be affecting their nitric oxide production. The next test that you can use, which is very common, is saliva. So this is based on a strip that you would use to gauge the quantity of nitric oxide present in the saliva. So remember that in that anterosalivary pathway, we have our enzymes is produced by the saliva, but we have that anaerobic bacteria, which is going to be where it converts. So the color change in the strip of the saliva is going to correspond with the overall bioavailability of nitric oxide within the body during the test. So it can make it an easy and accessible way to test the changes of nitric oxide. And that is really the most consistent thing. So it has a high level of reproducibility and repeatability in detecting changes in the salivary nitric oxide. It is questionable of how much that is relating to the overall body's production of nitric oxide. So it is an easy and accessible way. You essentially are going to not eat or drink 15 minutes before the test. You would create a pool of saliva and you are going to either different tests have different forms. You either put it on your finger after you wash your hands and put it on the test strip, or you put your saliva directly on the test strip. You wait about five seconds or so, and then that is going to provide a color, and then you're gonna match the color with the tube, and you'll have all of the different levels of nitric oxide. So again, it does make a great test to uh, look at the reproducibility, and so if you were in, if, let's say if you were testing a supplement, or if you were testing the nitric oxide exercises, you can definitely check out our other video on six ways to increase your nitric oxide. So if you're exploring any of those things, you could use this as a quick way to reassess. So then we'll move into blood testing. So deficiencies in nitric oxide can lead to blood clotting disorders. So testing some of these things can be really helpful if you're suspicious of that. So something like looking at prothrombin can measure the time it takes for blood to clot and can help assess for overall clotting. When we're looking at plasma nitric oxide, this is not the most reliable test to use. So this is something that is not used frequently and would not be re recommended. So now let's move into some of the indirect tests. So we, when we're talking about nitric oxide and we we're talking about this amazing ability of vasodilation, among many others, we want to think about this from a cardiovascular standpoint and a cardiometabolic standpoint. So when we're looking at a, a comprehensive cardiometabolic test, we can look at everything from cholesterol levels to diabetes to inflammation. It can help evaluate at a more thorough level endothelial function and associated conditions such as ED, such as arthrosclerosis and cardiovascular disease that nitric oxide might affect. So it's a great way to look a lot more in depth about what's happening. And we can also look at other measures such as a calcium score. So this is a cardiac CT calcium score, which is known as a coronary calcium scan. It's a quick 
convenient and non-invasive way to evaluate the amount of calcified or hard plaque that is in the heart vessels. So this can be something that I recommend quite frequently to my patients, especially if we're exploring the impact of their cardiometabolic testing. So if we see that they are at higher risk, we see that they have high cholesterol, they have high blood pressure, this would be kind of that first next step to look a little bit more in depth and then a cardiologist might require further testing as well. The next test that can be extremely valuable is the Dutch test. This is a hormone test. It's a complete panel that assesses 35 different hormones and neurotransmitters because nitric oxide deficiencies can lead to both hormone and neurotransmitter signaling disruptions in which testing for these can be highly recommended to evaluate for erectile dysfunction in men, for example, and any woman that is having some type of low libido, low blood flow, vaginal dryness because low testosterone levels, vascular issues, or a mix of both can cause erectile dysfunction. So if nitric oxide is suspected, this test can provide measurements and neurotransmitters that may be extremely valuable in looking into further. And then the last thing that we want to think about as it relates to cardiometabolic health is just assessing your blood pressure. So having, encouraging your patients to monitor it over the course of two weeks. So I had a patient that we were really working on a lot of these aspects. And we, while we were implementing a lot of nitric oxide strategies, I was having him monitor his blood pressure for over a month and we saw consistently with implementation of a lot of different interventions that his blood pressure continued to decrease. So it's a great way to really assess objectively and it's quick and convenient. So next up is looking at the airway. So we want to be thinking that if we're optimizing that parasinus pathway, that we need to promote nasal breathing. So everything that is associated with airway function is going to be relevant to determine if someone is able to breathe optimally. So first, from a basic perspective, is someone able to breathe through their nasal cavity for three minutes without breathing through their mouth? Are they able to breathe nasally all day without sighing and yawning frequently? If you're looking at the nasal valves, if you breathe in and out without performing this and then you pull apart, does this feel way easier as you pull that lateral wall out? If so, that could indicate that there may be a nasal obstruction. So that could be a deviated septum, that could be enlarged turbinates, that could be small nasal valves. Do they have TMJ? So as they open and close, is there any clicking, popping, pain, a shift to one side? Is there any pain with palpation, grinding? The malampati score, we want to be able to see the soft palate, the uvula very easily. And if it is completely covered, like as in the image on number four, then we know that there could be some obstruction. Do they have any hypertrophy of their tonsils? How is their tongue range of motion? Are we able to open up completely and bring the tongue to the roof of the mouth? Uh, is there a narrow palate? Is there a tooth grinding? And if warranted, a lot of my patients, I am sending for airway evaluation as well as sleep studies because this is going to affect their ability to nasal breathe, not only during the day, but during sleep as well. So next is stool testing. So this is going to be really important for many reasons. One of the most important is digestion and absorption. So this is going to give us a, a really good insight into how are they digesting their fats, their protein, carbs, and fats from pancreatic elastase. Certain stool tests, we can look at the ab ability to break down proteins. And ultimately, we want to think we need enough stomach acid to break down the protein. So we're actually getting enough L-arginine and nitric oxide production. We also want to think about the influence of the microbiome on the oral microbiome. So if we have a lot of dysbiosis in the gut, that is going to have a direct impact on our aerobic anaerobic bacteria in our mouth. And so that is, again, where we're trying to optimize that enterosalivary pathway. So this is going to be a really important aspect of looking at digestion and absorption and dis potential dysbiosis and how this can affect nit nitric oxide. And the last one is VO2 max. So VO2 max or maximal ox oxygen consumption is the maximum amount of oxygen that someone can use during intense exercise. So it's generally considered the best indicator of cardiovascular fitness and aerobic endurance. 
It's also a great indicator of longevity. So this can be something that you could measure compared to your baseline. So if you are looking at standards, you could also look at that. So it, it may depend on a variety of factors such as age and gender, but you could look at specific markers related to VO2 max and ranges, but then you can also compare your VO2 max to your VO2 max. So this can be a great overall indicator of nitric oxide production and symptoms of low VO2 can include things like headache, fatigue, anxiety, depression, difficulty sleeping. So it might be a really great way to, if it's accessible to you, to incorporate into your patient's program or if it's for you. So in summary, nitric oxide is a potent and frequently overlooked signaling molecule that regulates many functions in the body, such as blood circulation, cardiovascular system, hormones, neurotransmitters, and immune responses. So assessing levels of nitric oxide through salivary breath tests, and also utilizing cardiometabolic testing, hormonal testing, looking at the airway. All of these can provide guidance on any potential deficiencies that can impact heart, hormone, immune health, allowing us as practitioners to help rebalance these levels efficiently. I hope this was helpful. Remember to check out our other video on six ways to improve your nitric oxide and stay tuned for more videos like this on root cause medicine. Hey, thanks for watching our video. If you order a lab test for your medical practice, head over to rootbelt.com to order hundreds of different labs from over 35 different lab companies, including Dutch, Dr. Zeta, Mosaic, and more.